Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back. And uh, with us today, we have our special guest, Herbie J. Pilato. Hi, Herbie. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. Herbie J., it's great to have you back again. Now, I before we begin, I need to do uh, what I call a formal introduction. Give your credit so people know who you are in case they didn't see any of the past videos we've done with you. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Herbie J. Pilato is a producer, a performer, an entertainment executive, and a writer with a dozen books on TV and pop culture to his credit, as well as the talk show, then again with Herbie J. Pilato. How'd I do? Pretty good. You sounded like Ted Knight from Super Friends when he used to <laughs> do the voiceover for the Saturday morning cartoon. Ted, Ted Knight learned everything he learned from, from Johnny. Yeah, I, I just think that's important because you've first of all you've got a long list of credits and you've been you've been in television uh, for a long time, um, but of course what we're interested in today is your book, um, Gidgets, Glamour Gidgets, and the Girl Next Door, and, yes. and it's one of one of what a dozen that you more than a dozen I think. Well, it's it's about a dozen. I have three more new ones coming up, but so far it's it's twelve. Yeah, so I heard. You're a, very, you're a very prolific author, but you've also done a whole lot of television shows, and, and your your TV series, then again with Herbie J. Pilato, is, is you're doing more all the time, aren't you? Right. We have the first seasons on Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime UK, and we're working um, on the second season. We finished the second season, and we're looking to, uh, uh, we're, it's in post-production right now, so very excited yeah. about it. That's great. Great. And, and uh, the shows are great because you bring back uh, the actual actors who were on a television show, talk with them and everybody. It's, it's a different medium than the book. Uh, but the books are great. And, and the Gidget, I'm fascinated by the Gidget, uh, the Glamour Gidgets and the Girl Next Door, because you took the female leading ladies of, the, of television uh, from the 50s, 60s and 70s and they are such a diverse group, uh, and you treated them all individually, um, because. But they're also different. I, I want you to speak to to that uh, issue first. That there was such a variety of characters. Yeah, I mean, you know, there were so many monumental uh, women in television through the the core. My core decades are the '50s, '60s, and '70s. That those are my three decades that I focus on, and I wanted to make sure that I had representatives from each decade, uh, not only representatives from each decade, but a core representation of a particular show type, of a, of a particular actress type, and to make sure that all the cultures and the diversity and, uh, you know, the different, uh, different kinds of women um, were properly represented. For example, uh, in the 50s, the ideal um, a starlet at the time was um, Eleanor Donahue from Father Knows Best, um, and, and uh, certainly Ann Southern, which is also covered in the book. And then in the early 60s, it was a toss-up for covering, do I cover Marsha Brady, Maureen McCormick, or Susan Day as um, Laurie Partridge? And pretty much Maureen McCormick won out because I felt she was more popular, she was the most popular female young female star on the Brady Bunch, whereas David Cassidy kind of overshadowed uh, Susan Day on the Partridge family. So it was really tough choosing and limiting and narrowing down, you know, the actresses that I was going to cover. Um, certainly had to make sure that Nichelle Nichols, who was on Star Trek, a monumental historic persona um, on in the 1960s, as in a one-hour drama, was covered as she was one of the first African American women to be featured um, in a drama. And I also made sure to cover Diane Carroll, who also was uh, the first African American woman on television in a half-hour situation comedy. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I did cover everybody properly, and that I interviewed as many people as I could. Barbara Bain from Mission Impossible. Uh, Donna Douglas from the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, Don Wells from Gilligan's Island, who you know 
unfortunately just recently passed away. Um, Julie Newmar from from Batman. And I did not cover Batgirl, played by Yvonne Craig, because again, I tried to get one particular uh, female presence from one particular show. So if I, I couldn't do both Batgirl and Catwoman, so I had to choose Julie Newmar. And a lot of the reasons why I was limited was not so much uh, from a creative standpoint or who was better than this, oh, from an editorial standpoint. I could I only had so many pages, um, you know, to 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 write about these women in. I couldn't do nine hundred pages, which I've done before, but for this <laughs> time I, I I couldn't do it. So, quick so, question so there, us, Herbie, Herbie J, quick question yeah. for you: uh, of the twenty uh, uh, some odd uh, uh, people that you've chosen, and there. I recognize most of the names, as most people will, who grew up uh, with television uh, in, in those days. You actually knew many of these personally, many of these people. I, I did. I, I was um, a, a dear friend, or I felt I was a dear friend to Don Wells, and she was certainly a dear friend to me. Um, she, I had helped her early on with one of her books that she was going to, she was going to do a celebrity biography memoir, and I was helping her with that. And then she decided to do something different, which was, uh, I think it's called What Would Marianne Do, which was like a little gift type book, a little self-help type book. Yeah, she was a sweetheart. She was as down to earth as they come. And, you know, she was the the American dream girl as, as Marianne. You know, certainly Tina Louise, who I also cover in the book, was a, a, just a, a, adorable and gorgeous on that show. But Marianne was the more accessible one, I think, for the mainstream. Um, and I did not, I do not know Tina Louise, but I, I knew, I knew Dawn. Very, very devastated when she passed, and devastated for many people. So those of us who um, really love Batgirl mm. and uh, uh, Ginger, wasn't it Tina Louise Ginger? Yes, is that the right character? We. Maybe a little disappointed, but we don't hate you for it. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Tina Louise is covered, um, but Batgirl is not. Oh, so okay. Yvonne Craig is not. And uh, as I look back, I really kind of wish I did put put Yvonne yeah. in there because she was great. Yeah. Well, the the idea that you covered three decades um, is really a, a panorama of pop culture, if you will. <laughs> And I'd like you to address the what you what looking back what you think of those three decades of television, because let's face it, the fifties were totally different than the seventies. Yeah. Yes, that's that's for sure. And as is today, totally different than the eighties. Um, yeah, the fifties. You know, people people would put down shows like Five and O's Best or or the Donna Reed Show or Leave It to Beaver to some extent, thinking that they were just, oh, everybody's goody two-shoes, uh, everybody's so perfect in that family. And that's just not true. You know, with particular um, interest in Father Knows Best, you, you watch Father Knows Best, those shows, those characters on that show, Robert Young and, you know, Jane Wyatt, Billy Gregg, um, Lauren Chapin and Eleanor Donahue, they got along like a real family. They got angry with each other. They got upset with each other. There's one episode in which Jane Wyatt actually calls her children brats, brats um, on the air. And it was just, <laughs> that, you know, that was just, that's not smarmy. That's not goody two shoes. That's reality. Um, Leave it to Beaver, I think, you know, was from a, a kid's point of view. The other shows are for, from the adult's point of view, more or less. But Leave it to Beaver was the center, or, or Jerry Mathers as the Beaver was the center of that show. So it was interesting that he had that uh, perspective, or that perspective was presented. In the 1960s, things got a little looser. You know, the early 60s, however, were different than the late 60s. It was like 1967, everything changed. You know, everything went to color, first of all, on television. Uh, the styles changed dramatically. You know, I'm a huge fan of Dark Shadows, and... Um, if you look at the, you know, the first year and a half of Dark Shadows and the way they dress, it, it shows the history of how people really changed in when they uh, 
you know, in their, in their clothing and the wardrobe just within six months. So, and then the seventies, of course, is reflected by Mary Tyler Moore, um, uh, which was paved her, her path was paved by Marlo Thomas on that girl from the sixties and the early seventies, uh, were different, certainly from the late seventies. I remember when 1980 happened when just, it was like overnight. 1979, everybody loved disco. January 1980, nobody liked disco. It's like it happened <laughs> overnight. It was very strange. Um, but yeah, television was different and it should be different. It doesn't always reflect the era in which it's shown. In other words, you know, 50s TV didn't necessarily uh, reflect 50s real life. And 60s television didn't necessarily reflect uh, 60s real life. And 70s television didn't necessarily reflect 70s life. It was television maybe is kind of uh, uh, behind the times when it presents itself, if that makes any sense. I have a question for sure. you, Herbert J. Um, uh, and I'm going to make this a leading question, if you will. Uh, you started you started the book off by naming it Gidget, blah, 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 blah. And I took a, a look at the 20 some odd people that are in there. And as far as I could tell, Gidget was actually uh, one of the few, if only one, that was based on the, a real person, the writer's daughter, yeah. who is 80. And I just saw a recent article on her Vanity Fair. Um, First of all, did you know uh, the writer? Uh, no, I did not. I did and not. any particular reason you started with Gidget because she was she's quite an accomplished human being. The gal, uh, Kathy Conner, uh, I, I don't know what the married name is, but uh, who um, uh, it was based on. And obviously, it was all fantastical, the novels that the dad wrote, but uh, she was really a surfer uh, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Well, it just seemed to be. Uh, um, so representative of the book. You know, this wasn't <clears throat> about the older women or the mothers. I was actually going to save that for another book to do Carol Brady, you know, Shirley Partridge, Shirley Jones, Florence Henderson, and, and Jane Wyatt and those. Uh, so I tried to only focus on the younger set, thinking there would be a sequel one day, and there still might be. But Gidget seemed to just represent that, you know, fun-loving and and energetic and uplifting. And what Sally Field did with that role um, on the, the series, which is very unfortunately short-lived, is just amazing. If you watch that, she's got a bundle of energy, uh, just a tremendous talent. She uh, delivers her lines with such pizzazz and uh, such... Um, Charisma. She was only 15 years old and she ran the gamut of all different emotions on the show. She cried real tears in so many different episodes. She's just a, a, a complete, remarkable uh, per performer to watch in that show. It was her first show. And the series, unfortunately, was canceled uh, just only for that one season. And then it, it stayed on as far as in reruns that summer and it caught on. But everybody had moved on. So the sets were, you know, the show was canceled. The sets were were struck and all that. And they wanted to, to bring it back. But it couldn't happen. But So they found ABC loved Staley Field still. And they said, okay, let's keep her. And then she um, returned as the flying nun, which was Gidget in a habit, really. you know. And she wasn't really a nun yet. She was only a novice. So she could do kind of very different things. And, you know, The Flying Nun was along the lines of the kind of supernatural gimmickry shows that were happening on TV at the time with Bewitched and Genie and the Munsters. And and it was based on um, a novel called The Sixteenth Pelican, which is a very relatively serial comic novel, but they just <clears throat> made it a little gimmicky when it became The Flying Nun. In other words, they didn't call it The Sixteenth Pelican because people would be like, okay. what? So, you uh, in in covering each of these actresses, and by the way, Sally Fields, of course, it, al almost all of these actresses went on to bigger and better things. Not all of them, but uh, oh, Patty, Sally Patty Fields Duke. is a great example. Wow, sure. 
Patty Duke was yeah. terrific. Yeah. yeah. But um, in the book, you cover, uh, when you deal with each actress, you don't just cover the TV show uh, that they were in, which, of course, is important to us fans. But you also talk about them as individuals, as talented people. You talk a little bit about their career. I mean, it's a wonderful, uh, each one is a wonderful biography, I think, of the act, of the actress. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, there, I focused, you know, I mentioned their most famous role, but I definitely talk about their entire life and career. And I wanted people who read the book to be as happy reading the book as they were watching that show. You know, that's, you know, kind of my MO. It's not as though I write these fluff pieces or whatnot. I just don't focus on the negative. And if, and at the same time, if there's something compelling about someone's life, I try to uh, express that and explore that in a dignified manner, you know, without being gossipy or salacious or anything like that. So I think, you know, people want to know about, you know, who these people really were in real life and what they were really like. And, you know, did Ellie Mae really love critters? Yeah, she did. She loved animals in real life, Donna Douglas. Um, and she went on to become a great, uh, have great success as a realtor. Um, she was stereotyped by, by playing Ellie Mae, like many, many actresses were um, of the time, and actors, for that matter, because TV was different. You know, today, um, you could do TV and film, and, you know, certainly online, the way things are just melding together. But back in the day, if you were a TV star, you couldn't do movies because people, you know, it was like, oh, no, you can't do movies. You're just a TV actor. It was very, there was an arrogance about the movie industry at the time. But, so that kind of limited uh, limited the actors from doing other things from just their particular show, which they were contracted to do specifically. You can't do other shows and you can't do this. So there were a lot more limitations then. And actors today are more savvy as are their agents in negotiating deals. Um, and at the same time too, as I say, the media is TV and movies are becoming one. I mean, look what's happening with theaters. You know, there's no theaters right now and we're watching movies, on, brand new movies, you know, on TV and online. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, it's a, a long time since the 50s, 60s and 70s. So yeah. naturally things change. Yeah. Um, it, it's a wonderful book, Herbie J. And I, I am looking forward, even though you haven't promised this yet, I am looking forward to the one on TV Moms. I think that would be a great book. Yeah, I th I think I, had, I forgot the title. I, I had one in my mind, Golden Golden Gidgets or something. <laughs> something <like that. laughs> By the way, uh, uh, where is the best place for people to uh, uh, get a hold of your books? Well, certainly they're available on Amazon, um, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. You can go to my website, HerbieJPalato.com, and order them directly from me. Um, it's a little pricier that way, so you might have a better deal online. Um, certainly at wherever quality books are sold, you know, in person too. In Barnes and you walk into your Barnes and Noble, and if they don't have it listed there or on the shelves, you can just say, "Could you order it for me, please?" Great, thank cool. you. And of course, we've got to watch then again with Herbie J. Pilato on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and I have a little mask here. Oh. <laughs> oh, I just got these. I have one for my for my Mary Tyler Moore book too. But yeah, then again with Herbie J. Pilato on Amazon <laughs> Prime. That's great. Uh, nothing like uh, outrageous promotion, self promotion. We love it. <laughs> Herbie J. This has been great. Listen, um, we've got a lot more of your books that we want to pick your brains about. Uh, so we'll see you again soon. I hope. I hope so. You guys are always a treat to talk to. You're so so cool and amiable and down to earth. You're a, a rarity in the world, and uh, you should be worshipped and treasured for for the the great joy that you bring to the world. And I mean, we're gonna that. let our wives know that. Yeah, I was gonna say that's that's so true. <laughs> great. We'll see you again. In the meantime, everybody, enjoy. 
Glamour Digits and the Girl Next Door by Herbie J. Pilato. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.